Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Just Infrastructures Fall 2021 Speaker Series. My name is Carrie Carajalios, and along with Anita Chan, one of my fellow co-leads of the Just Infrastructures Initiative, we will be your host for today's event. For those of you who don't know us yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more information about our next event with Kit Walsh from the Electronic Frontier Foundation on October 13th at our website at just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat. You can see our full fall calendar of events there and last spring semester's recording there as well. We want to thank our fellow funders, the Computer Science Department, the School of Information Sciences, the Granger College of Engineering, SARIS, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic for supporting this programming. We have a long list of non-financial co-sponsors, and you can see our website. And who we also want to thank. We are also simulcasting in the Siebel Center for Design, the iSchools Room 126, and the CSHCI Lab. And thank you for those meeting space accommodations. That's a question. Use the Q&A box. For our live audiences in the Siebel Center for Design, in the iSchool 126, or in the CSHCI Lab, feel free to use a question strip and return those to the room host. We'll go through the questions at the end of the talk. Please feel free to indicate what unit, department, or organization you are from when you submit your question. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available during the talk. You can request any tech support in the chat. This talk is recorded, and we're live tweeting this talk with the hashtag, hashtag just infrastructures. We'd now like to ask you to join me in the land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of several nations, including the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to begin the process of working to dismantle the ongoing leg legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in history? We'd now like to turn it over to our esteemed presenters. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Fernanda Viegas and Dr. Martin Wattenberg. Doctors Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg are computer scientists whose work in machine learning focuses on transparency and interpretability as part of a broad agenda to improve human AI interaction. They are also well known for their contributions to social and collaborative data visualization. The systems they've created are used daily by millions of people. Viegas and Wattenberg co-founded the People and AI Research Team, or PEAR, at Google, where they hold positions as principal scientists. Wattenberg is a Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science at Harvard. Viegas joins Harvard in January 2022 as a Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and as a Sally Starling Professor at Radcliffe's Institute for Advanced Study. The duo is also known for visualization-based artwork, which has been exhibited in venues such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, London Institute of Contemporary Arts and the Whitney Museum of Modern Art of American Art. Please welcome Drs. Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Yes, we are so excited to be here today. We are very honored by the invitation to participate in the Just Infrastructures um, speaker series. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about ways of understanding AI, and we really mean this as a variety of different ways. We're going to be talking about everything from engineering tools um, to art, and I'll leave it at that. So let's start with a piece of conceptual art. Oh, it's from 2015, actually, not 2005. Um, and this, you know, there, there's always like temptation when you're looking at machine learning to kind of look at it for as if it were human, 
And I think for a lot of reasons, that's not always the best thing to do. However, in this art piece, we thought, let's take this in the totally opposite direction and let's treat it as if it's really human. In fact, let's give the AI a Rorschach test. So here's how we actually put that into practice. Um, there's an old project from many years ago of ink blots um, that I and Mark Volchuk did uh, that gave us a way to create sort of an infinite number of ink blots. We picked a couple of artificially generated ink blots. And just as in a human Rorschach test, you would give a human um, an ink blot and ask them that what they would see. Um, what we did is we chose four commercial vision APIs and we gave them these ink blot images, obviously not the things they were trained on. So with that, let's see what they actually said. So we have four robots. I'm just gonna, for simplicity, refer to them as robot one, two, and three. And you can see there's a really wide variety, you know, robots here, one and two, they're trying hard. Robot three is kind of just given up. It's like art. Robot four seems like it's on to us. Very interesting. All right, next slide. Okay, once again, robot one and two actually seeming to do their best under difficult circumstances. Robot three seems in the point of giving up with design. Robot four, black ink splotch illustration. Interesting. All right, next one. So here again, robots one and two, really trying hard. These are the Hufflepuffs of, um, or maybe Ravenclaws, I don't know. Um, robot three, it seems like it's just starting to roll over and, and, and forget about it. Um, robot four is kind of interesting. It's, it's really, it is trying to get into the spirit. It's for the first time it's seeing a face, which is interesting. Next slide. Okay, and here robot one and two, trying hard. Robot three, you know, it's almost seeming depressed here. It's like a cry for help. It's feeling isolated. Robot four, once again, is like, you can't fool me. And let's do one last one. Uh, and on this last image, we see robot one and two in true to form, trying hard. Robot three, that cry for help continues. Robot four is just sick of it. Black art splat. Okay, what did we learn from this? Uh, next slide, please. So, one thing I would ask you is, you know, I'm sort of playing this up as I describe it and giving them personalities, but did you notice anything about these robots? I'll mention that a couple of times when we showed people this, they did have something they noticed. Think about that for a moment. Next slide. Okay, robot four, which was a little bit insulting towards this generative art piece. Um, it, many people came up to me at various points and said, I don't think that is a robot. Um, and honestly, it is a little weird. There's something about it. And the interesting thing is this was from a vision API called CloudSight that at least when we did this in 2015, I later learned uh, reading a news story, apparently there were in fact humans backing what we thought was a piece of AI, okay? So it really actually, it's very interesting. What began as a very whimsical, you know, let's just do the reverse of what makes sense kind of concept art ended up teaching us something about what was going on behind the scenes. Next slide. And that is the theme of this talk, that every new perspective gives us new information. We need to sort of tackle something like AI through every possible lens that we can. Okay, and so to follow up on this thought that, you know, whether we're talking about art projects or engineering tools, the first thing we're going to start with now is um, a piece of engineering tool. We're going to talk about one of the latest projects we've uh, made public in pair at Google. It's called the Know Your Data tool, and it's um, a publicly available tool, and it addresses, a, a, you know, a, a major problem, which is Today, you know, too many engineers look at aggregate statistics of their data. Why is that problematic? Well, for a number of things. One is that um, the models, the AI models that we use uh, reflect their data. So if you're only looking at these aggregate statistics, are you really doing the best you can to understand what you're feeding your model, right? We also know that data set attention is low. It turns out researchers find researchers and engineers find it much in, more interesting, maybe much sexier, to fine tune their algorithms instead of actually doing the data cleaning work, right? And then also to compound to that, modern data sets tend to be massive. 
And so even if you want to look at your data, uh, how do you do it? It's, it's there, they can be huge and you, you know, there's exploration paralysis. It's most data sets are not visualizable and so forth. So the big insight here is if we could actually turn ML and it's, you know, upside down a little bit, if we could turn ML towards these massive data sets and we add it to that, an interactive UI, we felt like, oh, this could actually help move things forward. Um, and so with that, I'm going to um, show you a demo of Know Your Data. So we are on the Know Your Data um, page. As I said, this is public for everyone. And this is a catalog of data sets that uh, are visible today with Know Your Data. Okay, so I'm just gonna scroll here. You see that it gives you a little bit of a sneak peek um, of these data sets. This is Celeb A here. You can see people's uh, faces, shapes, 3D. Um, I'm actually going to click on this one called Coco Captions. So this data set is a data set of images that have been captioned, okay, by, um, by workers. So in fact, if I scroll down, you can see that I can very easily scroll down through uh, the images. You also start to notice interesting things like, for instance, there are bounding boxes, right? So these images have not only been labeled, there are bounding boxes. So let's click on this one, for instance. It's, a, it's a, an image of a zebra. And I scroll down and you can see what is what information is attached to this image. One of the most important things is the caption. So it turns out, ooh, let me click this away. Um, it turns out that each image in this data set has been um, given a caption by a Mechanical Turk worker. And there are five captions per image. And this is what you're seeing here, okay? These uh, five sentences that uh, have been attached. So. Things like zebra is standing with bowl of dirt in daylight, and then a zebra is standing over a metal bowl in a field, and so forth. So you get a sense of what this data set um, is about. So let's go back and uh, let's take a look at a, oh, sorry, let me go back again and take a look at a, a few of the things that um, Know Your Data is showing me. Know, know Your Data has done all the work that you see on the left panel here, um, where it finds a lot of things automatically for you. And it gives you um, kind of a notion of distribution. So for instance, if we look at the captions for all the images and we look at the words related to age, this is sort of the overall distribution that we see on the images here. So much more skewed towards younger people than elderly people. And in fact, any of these bars, and this is another thing that's really important in you Know Your Data, I can click on this bar and boom, it, it, um, it filters my view of the data set by that bar now. So you can see here at the very top, now it's filtering by young. And you can see that this is not only about people, right? I have a young uh, giraffe here, and I also have young people, okay? Um, I can get rid of this filter and I can go back and look for elderly. You know, if I click on that bar, okay, all of a sudden I have a number of different kinds of images here, uh, a lot of them with elderly people. OK, but um, as I was saying, it is really important to understand what is the distribution overall and how skewed your data set is. In fact, now let's look at some of the actions happening here. A man writing, if I click here, I will see that it's a man writing a wave on top of a surfboard. OK, so these are all of these images here. I want to look at, say, a person. Oh, it's also a surfboard, a person on a sur surfboard in the water. And if I scroll down to more signals that we can extract from here, I can see uh, some of the gendered signals here. And I can see that female in this part of the data set are very few images. I have very, very few images of females. If I click on male, I have a, lo a whole lot more. Again, this is the whole idea is, is to try to understand, you know, what kind of data are you dealing with when you train your model based on, on this given data set? 
another another thing that you can another kind of game you can play with know your data is to click here on the tab about relations and so here what we're going to do is we're going to start um crisscrossing things so i'm going to choose a feature number one here which is all of my caption words that have to do with attractiveness and another feature i want to be the feature on gender and now all of a sudden i have this matrix of words that have to do with attractiveness at the very top so you can see like attractive beautiful gorgeous handsome pretty sexy and on the on the um, vertical there i have words that are gendered words right so boy female girls whatever and what you have at the intersection of these dimensions, you have these cells that are colored. Um, the bluer a cell is, so this cell is very, very blue, uh, it means the more overrepresented this cell is in terms of the distribution of the data set. So in other words, the intersection between ladies and beautiful is 4.2 three, six times higher than it should have been otherwise. The same goes, but the opposite to orange. So male and beautiful, that intersection happens 0 0.2.24 times less uh, than it would otherwise, than you would have guessed. So in fact, if I click on something here, let's look for a female, beautiful or attractive, attractive female. These are the, these are the, images that had been captioned with these two words. In fact, let's look at this. Let's click on, on this very first one and let's look at the captions. So I have the captions here and I can see, you know, something like this. The beautiful blonde tennis player swings her racket, highlighting her strong, supple, well-toned muscles. Again, this is a caption from a Mechanical Turk worker, um, but it starts to give you a sense of maybe some of the biases um, in this data set. And, you know, you can start, you can continue to dig. And one of the things that um, is really interesting is to start to see, you know, what might be problems with my data set that I wasn't aware of before. And not only do we have these signals that are related to, say, language in this case, right? I've been showing captions. We also have um, signals that have to do with uh, things like exposure quality. So the quality of the image, you know, is it um, low exposure? Um, is it you know, what are what about the very highly exposed images that I have um, and, and so forth. So it gives you a chance to very quickly navigate massive amounts of data, trying to understand what are some of the patterns um, that you may be seeing there. OK, so going back, Martin, do you want to talk about uh, models? Oops. Oh, I think you're muted. Yes. All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about models. Um, and I want to talk about the BERT system. And in a little piece of uh, sort of understatement here, uh, we've said that this pre-trained network is pretty useful. Um, it and systems like it have actually turned out to be very useful for many different tasks. And it's interesting to explore them a little bit. Um, let's see, and we have a couple of demos. Uh, so let's see, next slide. I want to, before going to the first demo, I want to talk a little bit about um, how these things are trained. Basically, what they do is there's a bunch of things going on, and this is all going to be an oversimplification in the interest of time. But roughly speaking, one of the ways they're trained is to fill in blanks in sentences. So you say to be or not to be, that is the blank, and they will try to come up with an answer to that. Okay, next slide. So what we'll um, do here is give two demos that uh, um, give you a way of probing things that are going on with BERT. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, Fernanda and I like to give talks together. You're seeing this over Zoom. We're actually gonna switch back and forth a couple of times in what follows. So I apologize for any unsmoothness. So what I'm gonna do now is share my screens. I think Fernanda will have to unshare hers. Okay. 
and let's see. Okay, so what you should be seeing here um, is a web page. This is a public web page, something, you know, a type of so-called explorable that we're using. Um, and uh, hold on one second, let me, ah, sorry. Let me just unshare for a moment. Um, my apologies, my apologies. Um, okay, let's see if we can get that going again. Um, one second. So what you'll see here is uh, this is giving you um, this uh, sentence uh, that, I, as I showed you before, and it's showing how this model is potentially filling this in. Okay, um, it's got uh, to be or not to be. That is the blank, and then it shows a bunch of completions there. Um, question is number one, possibly because it is simply memorized what's going on, um, but you can see it actually has another sort of set of plausible things that, you know, maybe if Shakespeare had been a better writer, he would have said the problem or the truth. I'm joking, of course. Um, but, you know, these all seem reasonably interesting. But let's look at some other ways to investigate this data. Um, so here uh, we could see, um, let's look at two different uh, sentences where we've just changed a different word, Texas versus New York. And what we see here is that when we put in Texas, we see a bunch of uh, things that include horses, you know, there's everything stuff, but also guns. Um, in New York, we have things, you know, both apparently both in Texas and New York, they like to buy things. But this network is predicting books for the New Yorkers as opposed to horses for people in Texas. Very interesting. So this gives us sort of a, an interesting window into what is going on. Okay. Um, let's look at this in a more systematic way. We can actually um, say, let's look at all of these answers at once in a giant scatter plot. So what you see here is a plot where we said in Texas, they like to buy blank. In New, New York, they like to buy blank. And we've plotted each of the possible uh, words by the probability for Texas versus the probability for New York. So what you see above the diagonal here are things that are more likely in New York, which apparently include beer, oil, uh, gasoline uh, for Texas. Uh, whereas apparently in New York, we see art, painting, clothing, books, et cetera. And it becomes sort of a portrait of what has been, uh, what was embedded in that training data. Let's look at a couple of others. Um, we can also look for what's in a name. Um, and this is a very interesting little probe where we give two names, um, we see what year um, these are, and we can look at the likelihood of different years. So we can see that it seems to think that Lauren is much more likely here to have been born recently, whereas Elsie much more likely to be born in the 1600s and 1700s. And I will say that, you know, we also played with this, uh, we put in Fernanda and Martin to see when we would be born um, and I think let's 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 just get a sense of how that is because we can actually change this here and update. And apparently Fernanda is very up to I'm date. younger. <laughs> and I, I go back to the 1700s, you know, and I, I'm a, a contemporary of Plato, <laughs> apparently. Um, Okay, so I would encourage you, this is a public um, public demo by all means. Uh, I would go in and play with it. It's, it's, I think you actually learn a lot of subtle things in here. Um, now let's go to a second um, demo. And if you don't mind, Fernanda, I'm gonna ask you to project your slides again so we can explain this. Okay. So again, I wanna give an oversimplified version of how BERT works, how this system works under the hood. Um, it, 
to so a first approximation, it takes a sentence. And then for each word in the sentence, it is finding an embedding of that word in sp into space. It's representing it geometrically. And next slide. Uh, if I give it a different sentence, the words will go all go into a slightly different place. So it's, if I change like I to camera or camera to I, that will actually be affect the position of every embed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if I change camera um, from I, you'll see that lens, that even though that's the same word in both sentences, gets put into a slightly different position. Okay, this is by design. Um, and in fact, this is precisely what gives this type of embedding uh, sort of more flexibility than the classic kind of word to vec embedding, in which just sort of by definition there, a single word always gets the same position in space. These are contextual embeddings. So next slide. Um, and what we'd uh, like to do is show you a demo that what it does is instead of um, taking a bunch of words in a single sentence and where they go. What we do is we find one word and we track that across thousands of sentences taken, I think from Wikipedia in this case. And we look at all the different places that the same word can go. That's actually going to end up being a map of sort of the meanings, you know, you know to the degree that we can talk about meanings in this context that the system is assigned. Okay, with that, um, Fernando, if you can stop sharing and I will uh, share again. Um, uh, hold on one second. Uh, let us a few seconds here. Um, and okay. All right. Um, so what you see here, let's enter a word, I think, um, it started out with lie, but let's do something simple. Let's start out with rock, okay? So this is a, a map that's using the UMAP uh, dimensionality reduction technique to go from many, many dimensions into two-dimensional space. And what you can see is that the meanings, the, the, the embeddings really fall into two very different clusters. There's a cluster down here, which includes a lot of stuff about rock bands and rock concerts and rock and roll. And then there's another cluster up on the right that is corresponding to like volcanic rock or rocks called, you know, red rock country, rock climbing. So very nicely, this has separated out probably the two major meanings of the word rock. Let's try a few more. So this was all done in pair. Um, so in our group, but so let's put in the word pair and see what happens. Okay. So the interesting thing here is that pair doesn't have necessarily two wildly different meanings the way rock does, but it has kind of a spectrum. And you can go from things that are like base pairs, you know, this is in genetics, you can see there's different contexts of just two items. And then there's this kind of interesting sort of almost linear structure as we go down here and it turns into pairs of people. So people like kind of working more and more closely together until all that we get down to people who are married, basically. So we go from pairs of things um, you know, random, uh, you know, pairs of planets as far apart as possible, all the way down to married pairs of people. And somehow it is getting that kind of meaning too. Let's try one more. Let's do the word lens. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. And let's go. And you see something interesting here. So lens doesn't have a giant number of wildly different meanings either. Um, you know, it's got camera lenses as we did before and eye lenses as we talked about. And you can see that it's all a kind of one big blob. Again, kind of a spectrum of meaning maybe from artificial to real, nothing too dramatic. But if you look carefully, you'll notice a little island over here. These are all metaphorical uses of the word lens. And to the computer, this looks like a completely different meaning. And, you know, I thought this was kind of fascinating when I first saw this, because I thought, wait, you know, lens, it's all the same thing. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, this is really a different usage of the word, even though to a human, it feels like the same thing. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and maybe we can go back to the slides.
And, you know, what is fascinating to me about this is that this is a case where I think details really help. Um, what you're seeing here is a dictionary entry uh, for the word lens. And it's got the anatomy, it's got the physics, all the things we talked about seen there. But there was no specific entry for the metaphor. Um, there was no sliding scale from real to artificial. Um, whereas, next slide, um, what I would say is that this map actually to me is a much subtler view of language in some ways. And I'm not saying that this is as good as a human curated dictionary, but it is showing us an interesting alternative of how some of the subtlety and uncertainty that you naturally see with neural networks can maybe actually be an interesting anecdote to some of the natural, you know, violent boundaries of classification that we sometimes see. Okay, with that back to you. I will say actually one last thing is that if you do like dictionaries, um, I will say, and you believe that these word senses and dictionaries are important. One interesting thing is that um, we were able almost as a byproduct of work we were doing in this paper, at the time get state of the art results in word sense disambiguation simply by looking at these word embeddings. So if nothing else, that gives you a kind of um, orientation that a lot of the information you get in a dictionary is embedded. But I would argue you're actually getting even more information. All right. So one of the questions that we constantly ask ourselves um, in pair is, can we explain these kinds of things to lay people? Um, and we think it's important, right? Because um, when we when we're talking about AI, it's the kind of technology that's powerful enough that it starts to pervade many different aspects of our lives. And so we really feel like even though it can be uh, really technical and really hard to understand, we also think that people should develop a kind of intuition about this, this kind of technology and some of the challenges that come with this kind of technology. And so um, we feel that art is actually a really good channel uh, to expose folks to, regular folks to um, to artificial intelligence. And so one of the things we wanted to talk about today is this project called The Waterfall of Meaning. It was a piece that we made um, for a exhibit, an art exhibit at the Barbican Center in London. And we were interested in giving uh, people, visitors to the museum, a notion of um, biases in language and how we use language. Um, and so what we did is we created things like axes. You can see here, you know, words like new and old or bad and good or male and female and so forth. And we kind of wanted to see a waterfall of words fall through these axes. So if I were to, you know, type a word like poem, is that word more correlated with old or new, bad or good, and so forth. And you would see this beautiful movement of language through the perspective of these axes, okay? Now, keep in mind that um, when we talk about a piece like this, the kind, again, the training data that you use is extremely important, right? And so for this piece, the training data we used was um, a huge corpus of news articles. So here we're really talking about when you read the news, what kinds of correlations might you see? And so this is our team working on uh, the waterfall of meaning. And this is um, a little peak of what it looked like at the museum. And so I'll let you see, you know, a word like diamond um, falling down through the axes. This is actually footage from the museum. Oops, let me see if I can move. Yes, this is one of the visitors playing with the with the data visualization. And so what we did is you as the visitor, you could enter words in English and you would start to see these words fall through the waterfall. And anytime we had a seed word, which you entered, we would bring with together with that seed word, um, 
sort of its nearest neighbors, the words that were most closely correlated with that word. So for instance, if you typed in teacher, that were, you know, what are the closest words to teacher that would also should fall through that waterfall? And so this is another video. of kids uh, interacting with this visualization. And the thing I wanna do now is, oops, I want to actually show you the visualization. So this is, obviously we're not in a museum right now, but uh, we have a live demo. And so for instance, if I were to enter the word teacher, you can see my axes, right? New to old. So I can immediately see that teacher is being pulled towards old. And together with teacher, I have a number of words that came up, uh, pediatrician, uh, parishioner, uh, coursework. And you can see that teacher is closer to, you know, expensive. Um, and we have machine versus human and at the very bottom life versus death. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to start enter. If I don't enter words, it this demo enters them automatically for me. But uh, I'm going to start entering pizza. Let's see, where do we get pizza coming up? Is it coming up? Yes. So pizza kind of old. Um, and I'm going to contrast that to caviar. Let's see, do we have caviar? Yes. Let's enter caviar. Um, Baker has come up uh, with caviar. Cabbage is coming up, opulent, luxury. And I can see how different maybe caviar is from pizza. I'm also going to bring up chocolate. I have to, I'm a chocoholic. So I always bring up, I always demo things with, with chocolate. Um, and chocolate is kind of new. It's interesting, unlike caviar and pizza. Um, caviar is expensive, towards expensive, I should say. It's not super expensive in this view. Um, chocolate, interestingly, is more expensive than caviar, at least in the news, at least in terms of correlations in the news. Um, controversial, so you can, you can imagine just playing with this, um, with this demo and you know and having you know at some point we also um thought about having different kinds of axes letting people create their own axes um but one of the things that was really nice to see when uh we visited the museum is just how interested people were in this piece and and also like the different kinds of conversations that would come up um, as people were interacting with this uh, visualization and really kind of thoughtful debate around, whoa, I wouldn't think that this was whatever cheap or expensive or, um, and so it was a really interesting entry point for some of those folks um, in trying to understand how word correlations uh, or things like word embeddings, um, you know, might work. Um, so with that, let's let's continue talking. So we're going to get out of art for a little bit, and we're, but we are still going to be talking about lay users. So this is where we get into this notion of design and end users in products. And also, you know, it's one thing to do an art piece and to have people exposed to notions around AI. It's a different thing to employ AI to have people make choices. Um, and, and, you know, maybe purchasing or life choices. And so there, we really feel like we need to start to translate some of this MLEs into a language that end users understand. Okay, so one of the questions that always comes up in, say, a product is, should you hide details from end users? And the answer is always yes and no. Um, so we're going to talk about a specific case in Google from Google Flights. Here's the situation. Google Flights had a challenge. They had a really accurate model of price prediction, you know, that would say, you should buy your ticket now because it's going to go up or, you know, or, or wait, wait for a week before you buy this ticket. 
but there was no user trust. Users were like, why, why should I trust you? I, I'm not gonna buy my ticket now. And so it, it became clear that buying tickets is a very complicated decision. Um, it's hard to know if the fair if the price is price is fair right now because prices keep changing. Um, should I buy the ticket now? Should I wait? What happens? Um, and so there was a lot of research that went into how do we explain to users that we have an accurate model and that they should be using this to their advantage. Um, they tried different approaches that were kind of extreme. On one extreme was this very simple directive, like today is a good day to buy your ticket, to buy your flight. And they also tried kind of the opposite of that, which was we're going to explain as much as we can. So prices are unlikely to drop and there is 75% chance they will increase by $17 in the next five days. Neither one of these worked. The first one felt, the simple one felt salesy, not trustworthy. The second one was overwhelming. People were stressed. You're like, what do I do with all these data, with all, all the, the numbers? So one of the things that this team did was to go back to uh, this PEAR guidebook, which is a manual. It's, it's a set of guidelines that PEAR has put out. We use it internally at Google, and we also made it public around things like how might you think about AI explainability in an end user product? And so having used this, the guidance here, they went back and they decided what are the principles we're gonna buy by. So one, obviously we wanna be honest and surface accurate data. Number two, any information we surface should um, let users make a better decision. Okay, so actionable. And third, it needs to be concise. We can explain the world of algorithms to users. So how are we going to achieve three things, these three things? Very happy to say they chose to visualize their data. Yay for visualization. And so what they did is they showed, for instance, here on the left, we are showing a screenshot of a trip from New York, um, from um, LA to New York. And there is a there is a price four hundred and twenty nine dollars, and the interface is saying, look, this price is typical for this route. Okay, so it shows you what is low, what is high. It shows you the range, right? Which is great. If you want more details, you can also click on that range, and you can get the whole history of how this price fluctuated over time. So maybe you can start to see, oh wow, even though it's fluctuating. I see a trend going up. This price is going to continue to go up. Maybe I should buy it now. Okay. Another thing that Google did after doing a bunch of user studies is realizing that when the model was super certain, right, especially in the US, they created this program when they said, we're going to give you a guarantee. We're going to put, you know, we're going to put our money to back this up. If, if the price goes down, if you buy it and the price goes down, we're going to pay the difference to you. And so what this did is that it showed users that Google was so certain about their prediction that they're willing to put money on the table. OK, and that in turn made the decision that was very stressful for users much less stressful. So explaining and using trust um, was was incredibly helpful. OK, Martin, do you want to? Absolutely. So let's continue. One thing I want to say is that there is a really nice blog article by Slava Polanski that describes that uh, this work that we was was that Fernando was just describing. Um, so there's one last thing to say about design in the age of AI. Okay, next slide. So let's imagine that you're designing a system. It's automatically labeling some kind of content. You could picture videos, whatever. The particular type doesn't matter. Next slide. Let's ask a question. What details should a designer care about? You know, there's a million questions related to any kind of product. And let's just look at these questions and take a moment to ask yourself, which of these are user experience questions, which are not? Next slide. Okay, so three of them, I think, are just obviously user experience questions, right? 
Um, you know, do users see explanations? It's clear. You know, I like the hardware, the database, you probably wouldn't look at. And, you know, there's a loss function that I wrote down here. Uh, and, you know, it's very easy to blip over that and put it in the same category as hardware um, or databases. But next slide. Uh, what we would contend is that, in fact, this is the kind of thing that designers should look at very carefully. Next slide. And why? Why would that little chunk of math count as design or even user experience? Okay. Think about this for a moment. Like, what does it, what's going on? Well, here's the thing. That piece of math is in itself. So, and one thing I will say is that this is a, a vast oversimplification of real world systems. But even in this tiny simplification, this has, um, is expressing opinions that are important. For example, one implicit opinion here is that false positives are treated the same way as false negatives. In many real world systems, in fact, there's a big difference. Like one of those is clearly better than the other to have. Um, and you know, it's even expressing subtler opinions as well about different degrees of confidence and how important it is to get things right. So the, the result is that this actually is going to determine a lot about how people feel using the system. So next slide. You know, we'll just end with this sort of question of what, I think this is something that we all should be contemplating. How do we design when design doesn't just look like, you know, a beautifully architected airport like this left picture, but design also includes like maybe the shape of certain mathematical curves as in the right. So with that next slide, um, I would once again, put in a plug for the people plus AI guidebook which starts to address some of these issues. But I think this is something that we're all as a field, we're still figuring out, we need to all focus on. You know, how do we create guidance in these situations? And so with that, oh, you're muted. Yes, thank you. With that, the last plug we wanna leave you with is um, the fact that we are recruiting. We are looking for grad students uh, for our new lab at Harvard, um, you know, and our interests, as, I, as I'm sure you've noticed through this talk, range from visualization, machine learning, software art. Um, and so if you are interested, please uh, contact us. And with that, I think we are going to thank you and we would love yeah, to open you. up for questions. I, okay. So um, thank you, Fernanda and Martin. Um, we now have time for some audience questions. You can send us your questions via the Q&A box for our live audiences in the Siebel Center for Design, iSchool, and CS. Um, again, use the question strips that we mentioned earlier, and please indicate your unit, department, organization uh, when you submit your question. Um, Anita and I will moderate and I will read aloud our first question from the audience. Um, I just wanna stress that we have so many questions. We will not be able to get through all of them today. For the questions addressing URLs for how to reach these wonderful demos, um, some of them we've already put in the chat, but we will ask our, our guests for some of those URLs as well and put them on our website. Okay, um, first question is from Shweta Garg. Uh, she is an MS student in CS at UIUC. She says the language waterfall was very interesting, but I have a question. How do you decide what the different vertical axes are going to be in the waterfall model? For example, right now in the model, you showed multiple axes. One is from you to old, one is from expensive to cheap. When you have so many options to choose from, how do you choose what to ask or what to present? Uh, that's a great question. It's something that we went back and forth on because we had so many axes that we were interested in and also, some of these axes, as I'm sure you can understand, are more controversial than others. And so we, in the end, we decided to do um, things that some, where some of the axes were maybe a little bit more controversial and some of the axes were, were less controversial. At the museum, we had slightly different axes than what I just showed here. So for instance, at the museum, we had, I think we had male or female, some, something like that. Um, but for instance, one axis that was really interesting, but we didn't feel good 
adding was was uh, good and bad um, because it felt very judgmental in a sense. And even though you know it's all it's, it's just correlations uh, in news uh, articles, um, we we didn't feel right putting that axis up. But one, as I said, one of the things we had thought of is allowing users themselves to create on the fly axes. Um, maybe there's a version of that piece that we can do where you edit at axes yourself as a user, you know, which I think would be interesting. That's great. We'll take our, our next question, um, which comes for us from Davis Zhang, um, who's a computer science freshman here at UYUC. Uh, and he says, hi, Dr. Vegas and Dr. Wattenberg. This question isn't very related to today's presentation necessarily, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, in general, the notion that right now, even as AI, AI has made leaps and bounds, scientists do still do not still still do not have a deep intrinsic understanding of why AI works the way it does. What what are your thoughts about the future of AI, and will we ever understand how it works? So that is a good question. In fact, I think it's such a good question in a sense. Like I'm betting my career on trying to answer that or to, to try to make progress on it. Um, so I'm with you. It's an important question to ask. One of the things that I'll say, and this, you know, may, this, I would, if I had to sort of summarize my point of view, it's that something genuinely interesting is going on with the neural networks that we're seeing. Um, and we don't know what it is, but my belief is that there are interesting things akin to sort of mental models going on inside. Um, you know, there's actually a fairly big controversy right now over whether, um, you know, the current methods are sort of intrinsically limited or whether in fact they could take us to much greater strides. And, you know, this is a sort of boring moderate position in a way. My belief is we don't know, you know. Um, the reasons to think that they're limited are often taken from a low dimensional intuitions, belief that, oh, if we're looking for correlations between two and three variables, that's not very deep. The truth is we don't really understand what happens when you're looking for correlations and associations with vast numbers of variables and nonlinear functions. On the other hand, we don't know. In fact, it might be uh, that they're limited. But to me, this, this question is so interesting that I'm basically devoting a, a chunk of my life to trying to figure out the answer. Uh, so yeah, fascinating question. Uh, the next question is from Alex Kale, a PhD candidate at the UW School. Uh, he asks, when you create representations of meanings derived from ML models, how do you signal to audiences what aspects of meaning come from associations in the data that the ML picks up on versus what comes from the judgments and prior knowledge of data scientists? So I don't, I don't know if this is in relation to any specific project we were showing, but most often than not, we are, um, we tend to show the correlations picked up by the systems themselves. So I don't think there's any project, and chime in, Martin, if, if you uh, can think of anything, that we've done where we are showing preconceptions of data scientists. It tends to be things that um, come up in the data itself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Like one thing that I'm thinking about if I had to be critical of myself, it's that if I show a demo and a talk like this, I'm looking for things that are gonna be interesting. Um, and so in a sense, what you see if someone is showing you something is it's almost filtered to this interestingness filter and that could introduce all sorts of points of view subtly. Um, very generally with visualizations, there's always this question of how do you disentangle um, the truth, the data, which is different from the truth, if there is a truth. Um, there is the person who created the visualizations belief about what the truth is. Um, and then there's the reader or viewer of the visualization. and you know, the word truth is a complicated one. It means different things in all four contexts. And I think this is actually, uh, again, this is a big question for um, people who are making visualizations. There was a time when people would just think numbers don't lie. I don't know if many people ever thought that very seriously, but to some extent that was sort of a cliche. I think today we, more people are appreciating the depth of complexity of separating out many, many different entangled opinions in these things. 
Our next question comes from Shivram Agarwal, a PhD candidate in visualization research at the University of Duisburg Essen, Germany, who says, thanks for the wonderful perspective on visualization as a window to see the models. My questions are about the things a model learns and unlearns during training. First, whether understanding what, mo what mo a model learns and unlearns during the training is important for the developers and general users of that model. And second, if yes, how can the visualization address two challenges in this scenario, huge data and changes in model predictions? So I, I think the question about whether, you know, trying to have a visualization that shows what the model learns or unlearns, it's, it's an interesting one. I think most of the work we've done to date has been about what the model learns or what we can glimpse from what the model learns. There's something we haven't shown today that is one of um, my favorite uh, visualization of AI moments, which was a visualization of translation models that uh, Google has. And the moment when Google went from translation models that could only deal with one pair of languages to a single model that could deal with multiple languages, translating high quality wise from multiple languages into multiple languages without ever having seen, you know, say a, a, a sentence translated from English to Japanese. If you fed these languages um, into the models in a sense, it could find a bridge between, say, these two languages. Um, and that moment was incredibly interesting because it was the first moment, because visualization was incredibly important there. The people who were building these models had no idea how they had gotten so good at um, translating, doing zero-shot learning, right? What we call zero-shot learning. And the visualization was incredibly important in showing that these models, instead of separating these embedding um, regions into separate languages, so English over here in this corner and Japanese over here in the other corner and mapping through these languages, these models were bringing all of these languages together and paying attention to the semantic meaning of the words regardless of languages. And so it was this moment where the visualization gave us the first glimpse into what would be a universal language, if you will. Not a human universal language, but maybe a machine, you know, uh, generated universal language. Um, and so that was incredibly, that we were only able to get that insight through the use of visualization. Um, up to that point, it was not possible. So I think those kinds of, uh, understanding, it, it, it kind of bring, uh, brings us back a little bit to one of the demos that Martin showed today, which was that map of, of meanings of the same word. Because again, through a visualization, you can give this multidimensional sense of, of many meanings coexisting together in the same word, right? Which is hard to do, again, if you have a very bend dictionary with very separate senses of a word. You can see that things kind of seep through each other and there's, they are porous, right? Boundaries are porous. And this, this is, I think, much closer to how language feels. And so I feel like visualization is great when we're working with these massively high dimensional spaces um, where it's very hard to disentangle certain things. Visualization, I think, gives us a little bit of an upper uh, hand um, in, in trying to make sense of these very complex um, spaces. And the next question comes from Shruti Misra. Um, for the BERT example, people like to buy blank. Uh, the outputs for New York versus Texas um, you see a fairly substantial percentage difference between the likelihood of the top prediction and the subsequent predictions. How does that affect your analysis and conclusions? Oh, that's a very sharp eyes. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, I think it's um, I, and I, I don't know if there's a crisp answer to that. I think one way to think about it would be if you were looking at um, a particular application and you were only interested in the top answer you might think to yourself, oh, okay, in that case, maybe um, if the top answer is doing what I want, then 
all is well. Um, I think if you're trying to understand what is happening under the hood, then the sort of long tail of responses are quite interesting. But I think you're right that we should take that with a certain grain of salt, try to understand um, what the error bars are in some sense. The fact that we do see sort of a consistent pattern, I think indicates that it's not just noise, but uh, it's that's actually a yeah, very good, good catch on that. Yeah, because I think actually the the top two predictor predictions for both states was things. Yeah. So if you just stopped at the top prediction, it would look like they're exactly the same, right? But as Martin said, if you look a little bit deeper, you start to see a lot of difference. So yeah. I, I do think this falls into sort of the, one of the themes of our talk of this idea that when you look at sort of the really detailed data, you see stuff that you might not see if you looked at just an aggregate view or a very top level view. Exactly. The next question comes to us from Young Wang, a faculty at UIUC School of Information Sciences, who says, it is very interesting to see how the waterfall design is used by museums. Are you aware of any psychological effects of waterfall on people's learning experience? And what could go wrong when this design is used to promote informal learning or decision making? Oh, that's a great question. And I wish we had like a crisp answer, but uh, we haven't like, we haven't really done user studies, for instance, of, of that interface. Um, and the only things I can report on are, are very informal observations. I mean, one of the things we were very curious about is whether or not people would understand at all what that visualization was doing. Um, and it, even that was unclear to us. Um, you know, all of a sudden you have these axes and there's a bunch of words falling down through these. Does that make any sense to people? And so thankfully, when we went to, to the museum and we saw people interacting and the kind of conversations and questions they were asking, it became clear that at least, you know, again, <laughs> no random sample, no, you know, scientific uh, um, experiment here. But from what we observed, it was clear that people got it. Um, sometimes they would disagree with what they saw, and sometimes they would be surprised by what they saw, uh, but they got, and one of the things that was, however, difficult, and I think people tended to forget, was the fact that this, again, was trained on news articles. And so I feel like that, again, like the sources of these things need to be very clear. And so if we were to do this again, I, one of the things I was thinking is maybe we change the title of the piece. So it's very clear from the beginning that you're kind of looking at news. You're kind of looking at the bias in news. Um, but yeah, great question. Um, and now I'm gonna ask the last question of our, um, for our speakers. Uh, this is by Ombat. Um, and they ask, I'm majoring in CS and philosophy and I was curious to know your thoughts about the future of humanities in the future of AI. I mean, I think that is a, it's a very broad question. Um, it's a little bit like saying, what is the future of humanity and the future of computers? Uh, and I guess what I would say is like, this is, to me, this is not the kind of question where you think about it and say, I think the answer is X, but more the kind of question where you think, here's what I would like the future to be and then you work toward that future. I think we have a lot of agency over the answer to that question. I will also say, I'll take one little note here, which is if the question is about, I, I, I didn't understand, is it humanity or humanities? Uh, future of humanities. So one of the things I'll say is that I think in, in terms of, um, I am very excited about, about the, possibility of using AI to dig deeper into text and to really try to understand some of the meanings that are there. And so this is, I mean, it, I, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I do think that AI provides us with a very powerful set of new tools that we didn't have before to look at huge amounts of corpora of, of, of text. Um, and so much knowledge and so much nuance is there that I would love to start, you know, picking and finding things and seeing 
um, what we can learn. Yeah, I would agree. I think I actually misheard what the question was, and I apologize for that. But um, I would agree that I think there is really, really interesting stuff to be done, um, and that I think this hopefully can be energizing in all sorts of ways for people in both fields. Well, thank you again, Fernanda and Martin. That was amazing. We also want to take a moment to thank our production team and invite them to re-video. None of this would be possible without the back-end work of Mitchell Oliver, Jingyi Gu, Silas Shu, Tiffany Lee, Gabe Mallow, Jorge Rojas, Vinay Koshi, Samuel Kao, and our ASL interpreters, Nick and Chanel from UIUC's Dress Office. We also want to thank Rachel, Rachel Switsky and the Siebel Center for Design, the iSchool and the CS Department for accommodating live broadcasts in their spaces. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. A recording of this talk will be posted to our website. Join us again for our next event with Kit Walsh from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, on Wednesday, October 13. We hope to see you there. Bye for now.